Hello everyone, this is Dr. Young, and in this video, I want to start to introduce you to aromatic compounds. So we're going to take, you know, talk for a second about, you know, kind of what they are and where the name came from. But I want to focus a lot on uh, why these are so stable, and then in the following video, we'll talk about how to look at different compounds and decide if they're aromatic or not. So first, what is an aromatic compound? Um, back in the day, right, before we had all these instruments and we kind of knew what was going on, um, Scientists were using kind of whatever they had at their fingertips, sometimes literally their fingertips, to, to determine the difference between substances. And so there were legit people who, who would taste and smell compounds and be like, mm, these all seem kind of similar because they're all bitter or because they all are tart or because they burn or all kinds of different reasons. And so there was a whole bunch of uh, molecules that had a distinct odor. And so initially, these compounds were called aromatic because they had an aromatic quality. You could smell them, right? You think of like aroma. And so here are five different molecules. They all have aromatic qualities in that they all have distinct smells. So like, for example, benzaldehyde is this sort of almond cherry uh, smell, kind of like an amaretto-y sort of smell. Methyl salicylate, one of my favorites, is uh, oil of wintergreen. This is a wintergreen smell. I really like it. Uh, not everyone likes wintergreen. I'm a big fan, personally. I like root beer. Um, vanilla, and you'll never guess what it, smell, what it is in. It's in vanilla. It's one of the major components of vanilla. Uh, isobutyl acetate is um, part of the flavor and odor profile of bananas. If you smelled it, you'd be like, oh, that smells like some sort of like banana candy. And then limonene, again, you might uh, recognize just from the name that it's an important terpene in limes and lemons, and oranges, and, and oranges also. And so all of these compounds have distinct odors. They have smells. Not all of uh, organic molecules have distinct smells or odors. You wouldn't even tell if they were there. Um, but this is kind of like an old definition and concept. Nowadays, we talk about, when we're talking about aromatic compounds, we're, we're talking about specific structural qualities that impart a particular stability to a compound, and it changes the reactivity of that compound. And in order for us to determine what compounds are quote-unquote aromatic and have this aromatic stabilization, is that we look at these three different criteria, that they have a full ring of p orbitals, that they're planar, and they follow something called Huckel's rule, which has a permissible amount of pi electrons in its pi system. I'm not going to go into depth with these three rules on this video. I'm going to save that for the next video. What I want you to know right now is that this are sort of the modern definition. And yes, these type of aromatic compounds may have smells. They also may not smell like anything in particular. But of these five that I have here, the benzaldehyde, methyl salicylate, vanilla, and isobutyl acetate, and lemonine, only these three are technically aromatic compounds in the way that we are going to be talking about aromatic compounds and aromaticity moving forward. These three have a particular way to react, and these three are particularly stable given that they have three pi bonds in them, or at least three pi bonds in them. Most of these have actually four. So what makes aromatic compounds so stable? Why does it matter? Why do we care? What, what evidence is there of this? So now if I take a look at the hydrogenation data. And you, and what, you may have seen heat of hydrogenation data in previous videos, but just to remind you, when we're talking about the heat of hydrogenation, what we're saying is we're gonna do a catalytic hydrogenation on something. So in this example, I have a cyclohexene. If I do a catalytic hydrogenation of cyclohexene, I add H2 and like palladium on carbon or some other palladium catalyst, I'm just gonna fully hydrogenate it by adding those two hydrogens right here and here. And if I do that, it's going to release this amount of energy, right? The delta H, the heat of hydrogenation, the heat of hydrogenation here is negative 28.6, right? So it releases, it releases this amount of energy. And, or in other words, it goes from here. So if I looked at this chart down here, we're saying that uh, cyclohexene is here and it goes down to what we're going to call zero, just we're going to use cyclohexane as a sort of zero. And we're saying that it goes down in energy, right? It releases energy, it's favorable, it's exergonic, et cetera. It releases heat, it's, endo, it's a, a, exothermic. Now, when people did this with other compounds, right, they were like, okay, well, what if instead of having just one pi bond, we have two pi bonds. As you'd expect, that heat of hydrogenation goes up because now you have two pi bonds instead of just one pi bond. 
this may not come as a surprise, right? If you remember that uh, pi bonds are generally weaker than sigma bonds. And so what you're doing by adding a new pi bond, you're taking away a sigma bond and you're replacing it with a pi bond. So you're taking away a nice, stable, strong bond. You're replacing it with a higher energy, weaker bond. So of course, your whole molecule is going to go up in energy. And so as you add one, let me just write So as you go from no pi bonds to one pi bond, you go up about 28-ish kilocalories per mole. That's what the scale is. And if you go from one to two, and these are these are conjugated, notice they're not isolated, but if you go one to, if you go from one to two, it goes up about another 28-ish or so. And so you'd expect, right, that if I go up again, so if I had a third uh, alkene here, so now I have three in a row in a ring, you'd expect it to go up, you know, maybe another 28-ish, maybe 84 or so. However, when you do the hydrogenation of benzene, that is not what we see at all. In fact, we see benzene show up at a lower energy than just the diene. Benzene is going to show up at about uh, 50 kilocalories per mole. It's actually more stable than just having two alkenes. And that should be really odd, right? We would think, oh, we have fewer sigma bonds. We have more pi bonds. We should be going up in energy, but it's just not what we see. That's not how much energy gets released by it. So why, why might that be? So if you take a look at your other uh, conjugated pi systems, right? So let's say we look at like a butadiene. I'll just make this a, a butane, butene. We were saying that, oh, hey, look, you know, this has got a resonance structure, right? I can have those electrons move over, and those kick uh, out like that. And that means that puts my double bond here, but then I get a plus here, a lone pair here, so that becomes a negative. And I've got my... Um, my resonance contributors. Now I could go the other way too. That's the same thing, just flipped. But I could go. I could go in the other direction, right? I don't have to go right. I could go left also. But what we're saying is that gives us a structure that's kind of like, oh, you know, the double bonds are kind of everywhere. They're mostly here, you know. Or sorry, sorry, not mostly there. Not mostly in the middle. Because if we look at this, right, just to make sure we're all on the same page, this should definitely be your major contributor. And your minor should be the one where we have the charges, right? The major contributor is neutral. The minor is the one that, that not only breaks an octet at that carbocation, but also has a separation of charge. So the majority of my pi bonds should still be kind of where they were. But I'm starting to build up a little bit of a negative and a little bit of positive. So I have major minor contributors here. And that's, that's great, right? We've got a whole pi system, right? Remember that since all of these are sp2 um, hybridized, they all have p orbitals. And what we say is that these are able to overlap with one another to form one continuous pi system, right? This is all stuff from previous videos, right? So these are all able, able to overlap, and these are all able to overlap. Same idea. Now, if you look at an aromatic compound where you're going to use benzene as our first example, whoops. If we use benzene as our first example here, we see something kind of different. We don't see quite that same um, type of resonance contributors. So if I here's my benzene, I'll go ahead and I'll draw uh, my resonance contributors where I can move this alkene clockwise, but that bumps this one clockwise and that bumps this one clockwise. And so if I look at my contributor, I basically have the same structure, only the alkenes are in a different spot. And now with this one, there is no major or minor, right? They're, they're, they're equal. They're equal contributors. There's no major or minor contributor here. And so what that provides us with, what that provides us with is two really good resonance structures where I have stuff delocalized, right? If you look in the above one with the butadiene, mm, there's not a great, the other, the other contributor is not nearly as great. So those electrons don't get spread out as much. Here, since both contributors are awesome, we would say that you're going to spread them out completely, right? They are half in one place and half in another place. Or in other words, we don't have double single bonds in, in benzene. We have all one and a half bonds. And we see that when we actually use instruments and look at it, right? It's not, it's not as short as a double bond, nor is it as long as a single bond. It's somewhere in between. And so we sometimes abbreviate the structure of benzene as just simply being uh, uh, a hexagon with a circle in it, because those electrons really do truly get totally spread out. And like we've been saying in uh, all year in every video that I've talked about before, the more you can spread out electrons, the better, right? Delocalizing electrons allows them to reach a lower energy, uh, a lower energy level almost all the time. 
And I've got some drawings down here just to try to help visualize this a little bit more. Um, so if I have my benzene ring, and I'll try to draw this kind of sideways-ish. I know I'm not the, the best artist in the world here, but if I draw this kind of sideways-ish, where this is supposed to be kind of coming out at us. So I'm looking at the benzene from the, the, the side view. All right, so all of these intersections are carbons. What we're saying here is that since every single one of these carbons here is sp2, it has a leftover p orbital, and that p orbital is going to be going perpendicular to where all the stuff is. So I've got a p orbital going up and down, p orbital going up and down, etc. on all six of these carbons. And if I have them, if they're all oriented the same way and they're all overlapping, I can get the constructive the constructive interference going on with all of these top lobes and the destructive, or sorry, and also constructive interference going on with all of these bottom lobes. I know this is going to look kind of funny going underneath, but I can get them to all overlap to form bigger uh, molecular orbitals, which is what this is trying to show you, right? This drawing here is that what we're, when we talk about benzene, it's not that the electrons are located in one spot, it's that they're spread out in two big sort of stacks. It's almost like a sandwich in two big stacks, one lobe on, on one face of the benzene and one lobe on the bottom face of the benzene. So these electrons are really, really super spread out, which makes them really, really stable and makes it so that benzene doesn't really want to change that. So if you're trying to react benzene, you're trying to change how those electrons are spread out. You're, you're going to interrupt the aromaticity, which is going to cause you to have a really high energy transition state. And so what we see is that benzene reacts different. And I said benzene reacts different, but really it's all aromatic compounds react differently than you might expect, right? So aromatic compounds do not undergo the same reactions as isolated alkenes. So in previous chapters, right, you may have learned that, oh, I can do a um, acid catalyzed hydrolysis of an alkene where it goes Markovnikov. Um, that, that totally made sense then. I could add HCl to it. I could add Cl2 to an alkene. I could hydrogenate an alkene, um, add two H's to it. All of that stuff works for alkenes, right? All that chemistry that we knew. However, with aromatic compounds, right? So here's benzene. It's an aromatic compound. Now, if I try to add H plus in water to it, nothing. It doesn't do anything. No reaction. If I add HCl to benzene, Again, nothing. We're not going to see any difference. We just get benzene back. If I try to do just H2 and palladium, just with like a normal, a normal palladium catalyst, again, nothing. It just doesn't react with anything that we learned for the previous alkenes in the previous chapters. Um, it is just uh, too stable. The, the um, transition state is too high. We have to do different types of chemistry for it, which is what this next section of our class is going to be learning about what types of reactions can a, a, a benzene or other aromatic compounds undergo, and what's the mechanism like, and what reagents do we need to do. So I hope that gives you a little bit better idea of what an aromatic compound kind of is, just the, the idea that they're really stable, right? They have this aromatic stability, and that's because the electrons can get spread out in a ring, really delocalized, really stable, tend to not react uh, like regular alkenes do, even though it's kind of like there's three alkenes just in a circle. So what I want to do in the next video is I want to actually go through those three rules I was talking about. You know, the um, uh, full plane of sp, full plane of full uh, uh, circle of p orbitals, the fact that they have to be planar, and the fact that you have to follow Huckel's rule. I'm going to go over all of those in the next video. So go ahead and watch that next video. Uh, happy studying. Good luck.